Hello and welcome everyone. Um, this is our first event in the Indigenous Holistic Health series. This event was made possible by our amazing co-sponsors and collaborators, the Afro-American Cultural Center, the Good Life Center, and the Yale Center for Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration. First, I'll quickly introduce myself. Um, so, um, good evening, everyone. I am Diana Uncle Angide, and I introduce myself in a few different languages, uh, Navajo, Kiowa, and Comanche. My mother is Navajo from Monument Valley, Utah, on the Navajo Nation, and she is Reed People Clan. My father is Kiowa and Comanche from Southern Oklahoma in the Hobart area. Uh, and I am the Assistant Director for the Native American Cultural Center. I'm very happy to be introducing our student facilitator, E.C. Misu. E.C. is one of the newest members of the NACC House staff for this academic year. E.C. is a junior in Ezra Stiles College, majoring in ethnicity, race, and migration, and psychology. Outside of the Native American Cultural Center, EC is a research assistant in the Esteem and Social Perception and Communications Labs, Communication Labs, and is the current president of, I can't remember if I'm saying this right, it, it, it. <laughs> EC is also involved with the Association of Native Americans at Yale and Blackout. Let's give a warm welcome to this evening's facilitator, EC Mingo. Uh, Peace to Canada, uh, Evan Le Tudu, uh, Mingo Lesant, um, Waye Amabuga um, today, EC. Um, hi guys, um, my name is Evan, well, I was born Evan Mingo. Um, I go by EC. Uh, I am Cherokee Free People and Afro Seminole Creole, and I'm going to be the moderator for this event, as well as the men's circle at 6 p.m. tomorrow. Um, in this heated time of racial unrest and protest, communities all across the country have had to contend with their relationships with Blackness and its oppressed history in this country. From slavery to the basis of capitalistic America, Blackness pervades society everywhere you look. One of the most fascinating yet under-discussed intersections is Afro-Indigeneity, or peoples and communities that have African-American and Indigenous ancestry and cultural ties. The relationship of African and Afro-Indigenous peoples are complex as certain Native American communities both hid and intermarried, but also enslaved Black people and African Americans maintain anti-Indigenous rhetoric. Through this event, we hope to eliminate the complicated intersections of Afro-Indigeneity and masculinity. In the chat, um, I don't know, Diana, did you send it again? Um, in the chat, you'll find the RSPP for the men's circle if you wish to attend that event as well. Um, so before we begin, I'd like to ask that all the participants mute their mic so that we can ensure that everyone can hear our speaker throughout the presentation. Uh, feel free to utilize the reactions feature as well as the chat box if you have any comments or questions. There will be time towards the end of the presentation for Damon to accept questions. Uh, I am happy to introduce the keynote speaker, Damon Bellholter. For over 10 years, former professional athlete Damon Bellholter, who is Haida Klingit, and Afro-Indigenous has been working with youth and indigenous communities internationally through basketball camps, workshops, school visits, keynote speeches, and facilitating talking circles. And listening, a lot of listening to youth and community. Damon is passionate about recognizing and cultivating the gifts that already exist in our communities and allowing indigenous people to recognize and allow their gifts to rise to awareness through community and self-cultivation. By accompanying groups through sports and cultural exercises that focus on what we know today as self-empowerment, rising skills, and growth mindset training, Damon works with communities to enliven the timeless values present in ancestral knowledge, remembering and recovering the truth of who we are, resilient, brilliant, and caring people. Damon is no stranger to the hard work and dedication of a big dream, and one of his greatest joys is supporting and celebrating the many ways Indigenous youth and communities are determining their own goals while staying true to who they are and where they come from. Klatska Development was created to support this vitally important work of reclaiming the ancestral knowing and gifts within each of us 
and uplifting the health and well-being of Native communities. We believe in the power of the shared story, gift-centered exploration, resiliency, and rising skills training, and solution-oriented approaches. So thank you for being here, Damon. Cool. Uh, how uh, you see for the introduction and how uh, to everyone who took part in bringing me in and, and giving me the opportunity to share the space with everybody. Um, uh, my name is, my government name is Dan Bell Holter, and I challenge everyone on here, when you get a chance, repeat after me, everyone say, you don't have to unmute your mics, but everyone repeat after me, everyone say, Nung, Nung, Hot, Lung, Stungs, Nung, Hot, Lung, Stungs, Nung, Hot, Lung, Stungs. Okay, so what I'm gonna kind of do is I, uh, as we know, the the topics I'm covering and it, it the the reason I'm able to cover these topics is because of my journey, and I always emphasize the journey and what brought me to a certain point. And it's I have a very very interesting story and a very very unique story. But before I ex tell you about my story, my Haida name is Nung Hash Long Stones, which means big enough to hold two souls. And the reason I was able to be named that is because my mother potlatched me and my brother and sister, and uh, she paid uh, $35,000 worth of gifts um, to the opposing, not opposing, but the other side, because we believe in balance. So she paid $35,000 to all of the Ravens to attend. So th that wasn't just in cash, but that was given away in um, jewelry, um, blankets, dresses, hooligan grease, seaweed, salmon, halibut, all of our uh, traditional value was all given away. And that's how, what you do is you pay people to witness something so special. So when I was a young kid, the only reason I was able to get that name is because I had to shoot a deer my first year and I had to provide enough salmon to last my family the winter. And I did that. And I was like in third grade, fourth grade. So those are the things that I was kind of brought up in was living a very, very traditional way, but also connecting that to society. So my journey took started off in Heidelberg, Alaska, Hiktahundlai, like I said. So if you look at the Alaska map when you get an opportunity, I'm from the very southernest tip of southeast Alaska. The only way to get to where I'm from is to get there. The only way to get there is a boat or a plane. And something that's really interesting about my journey is when we hear elders, I, I grew up uh, watching my mother. She apprenticed our last 10 fluent speakers. And just so you guys know, we only have four fluent speakers who speak my language. Hodkil Haida is the language I spoke. And my people originated over in Haida Gwaii, and we made our, made our ways to the southern tip of southeast Alaska. And again, right, like I said, we only have four fluent speakers. I am nowhere near fluent. My mother is fluent. And if you enjoyed what I had to say, then, you know, say a blessing to my mother because uh, she did a lot of work to keep our language intact. But most importantly, what she did was she instilled in me what it meant to be a proud, young, indigenous black and Haida person, you know, she really, she always emphasized because I grew up in a town of 300 people and I'm the only, I was the only mixed kid there. So a lot of times I didn't feel like I belonged, but what made me feel like I belonged, regardless of the, only, the reason I was the only, the, the only black kid in my community, what made me feel like I belonged was my mom made sure that I knew who I was. She knew where we came from. She made sure I knew where I came from and all the things that went into that. I knew my songs, the protocol, knew how to hunt, knew how to fish. And she made sure that I was blessed with all these very, very powerful characteristics and traits. And I always emphasize all of my accomplishments. They wouldn't have happened without my mother and those who came before her. So we talk about our ancestral knowledge and the things that I talk about. As a kid, I listened to all of my elders and they were talk about um, listen to your ancestors, listen to your ancestors. And I look at them like they're crazy. Like, what are you talking about as a kid? And that's what much like a lot of us do. We look at it like, we'll listen to our elders and some of the things they say will get thrown off by it. And as a kid, I didn't understand the concept of listen to your ancestors or your ancestors are guiding you. 
And when I talk about my journey and we talk about the power of our ancestors and how much they're able to guide us and propel us to certain places, again, I'm from a town of 300 people. And when, if, when you get an opportunity, I'd like you to look up uh, the percentage of high school basketball players who play collegiate basketball and the percentage of high school basketball players who play professional basketball. To put things in perspective, coming where I come from and the experiences I had, domestic violence, alcoholism, drug abuse, um, you know, I had no male role models and there's a lot of toxic behavior in my community. Underlying thing was trauma. There was a ton of trauma in my community. But when I was in seventh grade, I had this crazy, crazy dream. And again, I talk about the ancestors guiding me. And I, if I could call this something, if I phrase this keynote as something and call it something, I would call it um, passion to purpose because I had a passion for basketball and what that did was it led me to my purpose. And that's what we all kind of figure out. We're all in academia right now. Some of us are in academia. Some of us are struggling in school. Some of us are going through all, all these struggles trying to get to our big goal, but where you don't really understand our purpose. We're just kind of checking box a lot of the time, you know? And that's what my thing was, is I just kept checking boxes in a sense. I didn't understand my purpose. So, you know, I go back to Heidelberg, town of 300 people again, I'm in seventh grade and I had a dream. I had this crazy dream and to most people it would be wild. And if you told me the percentages now, I would think it was wild as well. Um, I'm in seventh grade. I had just come back from a family vacation in Seattle and I was this chubby kid. I was 5'10", about 230 pounds. Okay? <laughs> I was, you know, I was, was not athletic. I had no athleticism. I had zero confidence, you know, and I was, uh, I had a lot of suicidal tendencies for about three years because I dealt with being called the N-word from the time I was in first grade to being, sorry, then I started becoming, being called fat. And I had all these, um, these insecurities. So I went to a basketball game my seventh grade year and I got to watch Allen Iverson. You know, and if you, if you know anything about basketball, you know who Allen Iverson is. And Al, Allen Iverson was my hero, even though I was a post player, I thought I could dribble, I thought I could do all of these things. So I wanted to be like Allen Iverson. So my seventh grade year, I got to watch the 76ers and that's where everything kind of switched for me. And, and the, this light came on in a sense. Seventh grade year, I came back from my vacation and we had to do a project. And the project was, what do you want to be when you grow up? And of course, I raise my hand, I go up to present. I get up in front of everybody and I say, I'm going to be on television someday. I'm going to play college basketball. I'm going to be, I'm going to play in the NBA someday. In my room, the room erupted with laughter. And that was the reaction I got because if we grow up in some of our communities, we understand how hard it is to make it out and have people consistently cheering you on. If you grow up in the reservation or you come up from um, tough, tough communities or tough environments with a lot of trauma, there's a lot of lateral oppression. And that's what I got to see throughout my whole entire journey. But I didn't realize it was grounded in trauma. There was people hoping on my failure because of all of the trauma that was in my community. So fast forward, I uh, go into my eighth grade year and I was extremely motivated. I lost a bunch of weight. I lost about 30 pounds. I grew four or five inches. And slowly but surely, um, I kind of started to instill this mindset of I was going to make it no matter what. And again, I was just trying to check boxes because of my mindset was I want to prove everybody wrong. I want to, I want to make sure everyone knows that I'm going to make it there. I'm going to do it. And no one could tell me any differently. So I had to adopt this mindset and it's a crazy mindset. So again, imagine being in a town of 300 people and confidently thinking that you're going to go play on television someday when it had never been done. There was no other Alaska native kids who come from these small communities and not just Alaska native because I've been around Indian country. There's very few kids who come off the reservation who in that the biggest reservations in the country. There's very few kids who come off the reservation and play division one basketball or play in the NBA. So I had this big, big dream, but I didn't realize my ancestors were guiding me. My ancestors said, what we're going to do is we're going to grab this kid in Heidelberg, Alaska, and we're going to guide him to his goals and his dreams. But in the meantime, we're going to start slowly introducing him to his purpose. And I uh, had the opportunity. I played for a team called Friends of Hoop. I made a team called Friends of Hoop when I was 14 years, 15 years old, going into my sophomore year. This team had Isaiah Thomas, who's currently in the NBA, Spencer Hawes, uh, John Brockman, um, you know, all these amazing names and guys who eventually played in the NBA. And I, again, I'm a village boy. So when I left my community, I talked real Haida. I was super duper Haida. I talked super slow, just like a village boy. I didn't want to talk in front of nobody. 
You know, that was the, uh, I had to get over so many hurdles. And what happens when, as we know, when a lot of our indigenous kids go to academia, we go to university, we have the highest drop, dropout rates. It's for a reason. It's because we're not connected to our culture anymore. It's not, it's because we're not around what's familiar. So what I had to do was I had to take myself completely out of my comfort zone, village boy, big fish in a small pond, like a lot of us are when we come from our small communities, we're a big fish in a small pond. We might be the smartest, we might be the strongest, most athletic, but once we leave, now we're in this big gigantic pool and everyone's kind of on the same level. And what I realized was throughout my journey, I had to always defend myself and explain myself. What's up, bro? You're an Eskimo. They don't got basketball up there. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm Haida, I'm Schlinge, I'm also black, and I come from, you know, this is where I come from. I'm not from some anywhere, this, this is where I come from. So I had to be very, very firm in my identity. So I make this AAU team, and something really, like the world try, kind of starts shifting for me. And I make this team, a week later, again, I'm very, very overwhelmed. I'm around all these quote unquote alphas who are nationally ranked basketball players, who are bigger than me, who are more athletic than me. A week later, I go out to the Houston Hoop Classic, and I look over in the crowd at our very first game. I look in the crowd. There's Coach K from, from Duke, Roy Williams from North Carolina. Again, I'm a village boy, straight out of the village, you know. And when I talk about the ancestors guiding us to our purpose, like, I truly believe it. And I've been able to kind of uh, pick apart my journey to see how that happened. So I made this team, and I end up at Oral Roberts University. I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma right now visiting my son. And Tulsa and Oral Roberts University is right down the road. If you're familiar with Oral Roberts University, it costs about $70,000 a year to go there. It's a private university and it's a private Christian university. Things they don't tell you when they recruit you. <laughs> so I show up at this school and first day, there's all these kids being moved with two parents. Okay, My parents are not together and haven't been together for a very long time. I see all these kids rolling up in Audis, Mercedes, and probably similar to some of the things you guys see at Yale. You know, I had to see all of these things and I started to adopt this mindset just for a little bit. I got jealous for a little bit. One, like, I wish I had my parents dropping me off. Two, wow, I'm broke. <laughs> like, that was the first thing that came to mind was I am broke. But as time went on, and this is what I, you know, if you have opportunities to share with the next generation and the kids who come after you step into very intimidating, intimidating places like Yale as a person of color or, or wherever the case may be, and you're going to have those opportunities, I would um, encourage you to, to really help kids focus on their positives and the things that have allowed them to be there. And that was my thing at Oral Roberts University. I was kind of, in, I would interact with these students and I would see how privileged and entitled they were. I saw how they would react to like very small things and how they would get worked up and so entitled to things. But as time went on, I said, okay, I don't have what you have, but you don't have what I have. I'm from Heidelberg, Alaska. You know, I'm a village boy straight out of the village. I grew up hunting, I grew up fishing. I could go survive in the woods if you drop me off tomorrow. These are the important skills that I have, you know? so you fast forward to my college career and I had a really special opportunity. I make the Boston Celtics, you know, and I was there for training camp and I talk, tell people all the time, I didn't have some big, long, crazy, miraculous journey or a, a career. I was there for like four or five games. I played like five games, you know, I spent time there in training camp and it was an amazing opportunity, but again, purpose. I saw the big picture. And uh, once I had opportunity, because Kevin Garnett, if some of you guys know who Kevin Garnett is, um, NBA All-Star, my, my hero. He was my hero. I had him all over my wall as a kid on Slam Magazine. I had opportunity. I dapped up Kevin Garnett. Once I did that, I was like, okay, I'm good. I'm done. I don't need to play basketball anymore. That was the mindset. I was like, I'm cool. I've, I've done it. I've accomplished what I needed to accomplish. I made my dream come true. Now I'm going to do you know, what I truly love. But that what I true love started my freshman year of college. And again, that's what I, when I, when I work with people, I want them to take that from this is that you don't have to be MBL. So you don't have to do anything spectacular or, or amazing. You just have to care and you have to represent your people and, 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 and do the right thing by your people. So I found what I was passionate about my freshman year of college. And what that was, was I loved working with kids. I did that my very first basketball camp at a camp here at Oral Roberts. I saw how kids gravitated towards me, but that's all I had at the time. I had the, the height, the size, and, and kids would come towards me, and, but I saw that kids didn't gravitate to the other basketball players as much as me. 
So I started to realize like, okay, like I'm, I, I enjoy this. I love this. I love seeing kids light up. I love seeing kids smile, you know? And once I saw that, I was like, okay, this is probably what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. When we talk about purpose, you know, and when we talk about giving back to your community, my freshman year of college, I said, I'm a division one athlete. So guess what? I need to give back to my community as much as possible because at the end of the day, was, I have privilege now. And at the time I didn't, I wasn't able to put that language behind it is that I had privilege. So freshman year, I do my very first basketball camp. And I uh, did it back home. Right after I did a camp here, I went back home to Heidelberg. I had like 60 kids. It was the coolest experience ever. And I remember just seeing how kids were reacting to me and how they were looking up to me and how I, what I was doing. And the next summer, I did five camps. The summer after that, a couple of people were at my camp and said, okay, Damon, you could tell a story as well. You want to come do this youth, youth keynote? And that's eventually how it grew. And while I was in college, I, was, I wasn't really caring about academia, to be honest with you. I didn't care about school. I was a typical, typical athlete in a sense, but I was doing my real education in my summer times where I was doing 10 to 15 basketball camps in the summertime. And I, what I was doing is I was going to the most rural um, communities, Kalskeg, Alaska, Aniak, Alaska, Clem to British Columbia, and I would immerse myself into these communities. Literally, I would go in there and I'd be there for a week long. I'd visit there. They'd come tell me, come to a basketball camp. I'd go to their language center. I go to their senior center. I go to visit every single school. Okay. And that's what I talk about when we talk about impact and we talk about giving back, you know, and that's what I would encourage all of you to do to when you have opportunities and you got, cause all of you guys are probably going to be asked to speak. You, some of you probably are already have been asked to speak at some point when you speak and you give your time, make sure you wholeheartedly give your time to every opportunity you get. That's something I would really encourage you to do every opportunity. So when people would bring me to their communities, I would do a week, I would be in there for a week, but I would just literally walk through the communities, go help people fit, uh, clean salmon. I would go hang out with the elders. I was just, I was so interested in, in learning about other cultures and wanting to do that, that I was like, I, just, I, I, I love it because I grew up in culture. I grew up learning my culture. So I was really interested in other people's culture. Were they the same? Were they different? What made an indigenous community thrive? Why is this indigenous community struggling? I started to learn about trauma, but again, I didn't start to, I wasn't able to put language behind what I was seeing until the last couple of years where I really sat down and looked at all of the experiences that I've gotten. And what it did, did was it started like to open up, open up my mind to what's needed. And that's what led me to this, ma this masculine work or this men's work is four, three years ago, okay? And after multiple, you know, years and years of basketball camps, six, seven years of basketball camps, um, keynotes, facilitating all these different things, I uh, retired from basketball. I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia, and that's why I kind of talk on this, this, this timeline. I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia three years ago, and I'm training over there. I'm working out. It's one of my favorite cities. I, I'll go in there. I'll bring my trainer in there, and we'll work out for three or four weeks before I go off to my professional season, and uh, I brought him in, and I felt really weird about leaving. I felt really, really weird about leaving. And what a lot of people don't understand is I, my basketball accomplishments, that career, it speaks for itself. And you could go and look it up. And, and I've, I know I had an accomplished basketball career, but a lot of people didn't understand everything that came with it. They didn't understand me being in Istanbul, Turkey. This is the year after I played for the Celtics, I played in Istanbul, Turkey. They understand the mental toll it plays on you. I'm playing in Istanbul, Turkey and I'm depressed, I'm over there for eight months, I don't get to see my son at the time, and I'm going through all these struggles, and a lot of people aren't really understanding what that entails. So by that time, I knew I was done with basketball. I was just kind of figuring out my exit strategy in a sense, but I didn't realize when I was gonna do it. So I had finished up my last year, I played in Italy, in deep, deep Sicily, you know, playing on the beach, like near the beach, like an amazing experience, something a kid from Heidelberg, Alaska would never, never think was possible. So three years ago, I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia, and I decided, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm done with basketball. I called up my agent and uh, I get him on the phone. He says, uh, I'm, I tell him like, I'm, I'm done, man. I'm burnt out with this stuff. I don't really want to do it. He's like, what are you talking about? Because I was about to sign, like I had a contract in front of me to go to Greece and play in top division Greece for a lot of money. And I was literally sitting there. I sat there for a full day looking at this contract saying, I go over there. I'm not going to be happy. I'm going to be sad. I'm going to miss my son. 
And I said to myself, okay, you want me to do? And this is what a lot of people are terrified to do because everyone wants security. And so many people, what I've seen are, are terrified to bet on themselves. And I, again, I'm not the expert of manifestation or whatever the case may be. But I know I've manifested my whole entire life by constantly putting in energy and, 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 and just constantly think about what I want my communities to look like, what I want our kids to be learning. So three years ago, I said, I'm done with basketball. My agent said, what are you going to do? I said, uh, I don't know. I'm gonna. <laughs> I've done some good work around Indian country. Let's see if anyone fi finds it valuable. <laughs> so I uh, sent. I got on the email for about two weeks, and I just emailed organizations and tribes. Was like, hey, I'm doing this full time, you know. And you know, lo and behold, I got booked for nine months straight. I was literally doing an event every week for about nine months straight, which has the conversation of this mental health. We talk about burning out. I had to learn my thresholds. So I retired that August. And I got super busy. And what happened was I um, was working, I was going nonstop as an entrepreneur for eight months, which I had already been doing. And then I get hired by one of our corporations in Alaska called Sea Alaska. And Sea Alaska was de developed through the ANSCA Act. The de uh, ANSCA Act was started in 1978, or sorry, 1972. And what they did was they allotted up 12 regions of Alaska. So in Alaska, we have our tribes, we have our local tribes, and we have our corporations. Yeah. And our corporations, they manage a lot of our land in these areas. So if you look up our corporations, ASRC, they're our richest corporation because they have oil money. See, Alaska, I think we're number three right now. And that's my region of Southeast. So my role was when I got brought on, I got brought on as the director of youth and community development. And they created this position for me. And this is going to be funny for a lot of you who have done interns. I've never done an intern. I've never, I've never done any of that. I've never done an internship. I've never had those. I didn't have the time or the access to those in a sense because I was so busy with basketball. But my internship for so long was me going to 100 indigenous communities, me learning how to put, be in a room and be able to manage 50 third graders. <laughs> you know, being able to do all these things, I learned the real life skills and I learned the skills that were going to propel me. So I get done and, uh, I get hired by Seal Asset Corporation and I hit the ground running. And now I have a ton of resources at my disposal. And that's what kind of led me to this conversation. I sat down and I was like, okay, I have these resources, resources at my disposal. I have Seal Asset Corporation behind me. They have a ton of money. They have a lot of resources. What am I going to do? So I said, okay, I'm going to go into every single community. We talk about listening. I'm going to go into every single community in Southeast Alaska. I'm going to sit down with, with the principal, the superintendent, the uh, the tribal council, the chiefs, if, if, if they have some, you know, and I'm just going to sit down and listen and say, what do you want in your community? What do you need in your community? And if you're familiar with tribal politics, and you're familiar with our councils and whatnot, you'll know that that doesn't, that doesn't happen. <laughs> our, our leadership does not get out into the community and listen. And that's what I wanted to do was listen. I always wanted to listen. And I always emphasize being a doer. And if you, see, if you see a problem, you don't sit around and ask about it and question it. You go off and you figure out, okay, how am I going to help solve, be a part of solving this problem? Not solve the problem, but be a part of solving the problem. So I sat there and I listened and I listened and I listened. I said, okay, I know what it is. And then I already had all this data and I said, okay, I've been traveling the country for 10 years. And all of us know when we come from, again, from the reservation, from the hood or, you know, from, from a tough, tough environment, there's so many of those prominent athletes who never made it out, you know, and I started to travel more. I started to hear these constant stories of all these prominent athletes who didn't make it out. So I had to really sit back and think of like, okay, what's going on here? Then I started to look in their statistics. I started to see that Alaska native men, we count for 7% of Alaska's population, but we represent 38% of the prison population. Just like in the city, just like that's the, the African-American community, African-American men are the highest incarcerated demographic, you know? And once I started to hear all these things, I'm okay, we have so many things in common. <laughs> you know, we're some two of the most oppressed demographics, but no one's talking about it in a sense. Because what got me to have this conversation was, everyone started talking, you know, toxic masculinity, toxic masculinity, everything that's wrong with men. And I had to take a step back and say it, because at the end of the day, I have survival's remorse. because 
so many talented young men who are, could have been prominent artists, athletes come from where I come from. And if you look up Haida Art, which I encourage you to do, Haida artists were some of the greatest artists on the Pacific Northwest. And if you see any art in the Pacific Northwest, it was influenced by the Haida people. We are the canoe people of the Northwest, 150 foot war canoes. You go to museums and there's big gigantic war, war canoes. And that's why I'm really passionate about it. But what I saw was, I saw this underlying narrative, you know, I saw the narrative as, of these prominent young men dropping off. And that's what I realized in my journey was there's a group of 25 of us, let's say, and 25 of these boys, 22 go this way, three of us go this way. That's it. Everyone else, all these guys are dead or in jail. Two of those boys in this group, I, I watched them be buried in the last two years. I just came home from burying an 18 year old young man. So there's a big, big issue going on, but nobody's talking about it. And what I said was, okay, I'm not going to sit around and say, because people were coming to me as a person with a platform, people were coming to me and saying, hey, Damon, what are you going to do about mercy, uh, murder and missing indigenous women? Are you going to speak on it? Are you going to talk on it? You need to be advocating for it. And I said, okay, you know, I'm going to, I am 100%, but that's not my place. It's not my space to come in there and say, woman power, woman power, that's not my space. So what I had to take a step back and really pay attention to, okay, what can I do? Okay, what can I do? What, you know, what can I do? Because if I'm going around doing that, it felt like performative action, you know, what we talk, the perform, performative allyship. And I saw that and I was like, okay, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start creating men's spaces and boys spaces. And this was three years ago. And this had to come after me again, eight or eight, or eight years or so of being in indigenous communities and then being with the black community. And what I saw was, okay, there's this, there's an issue going on here and there's no resources. So back home, what I did was, and everyone who started asking me, hey, Damon, could you come to a basketball camp? I said, okay, um, I'd like to do that, but can I spend time with your boys and your men? What, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Can I spend time with your boys and men? It threw so many people off, like surprisingly. And the first, I, I started doing them and I had to gain confidence in it. And Disclaimer for everybody, you know, and that's what this is the same thing I tell all of my men's spaces. I'm not the guru. I'm not the master of masculinity. I'm not, you know, nothing. All I do is I go off of my lived experience as a black and indigenous man. And I go off my lived experience of working with 100 indigenous tribes and being in the black community. That's what I go off my experience. Okay. And I've done a lot of research on these statistics and the things that our communities struggle with when it comes to our men of color. So I started doing the circles and a story I'll share with you, you know, when we can't really talk about creating that space, I was in my hometown and there's a young man who had just, he, uh, we had culture camp going on and I was hosting a men's space. It's probably like the, maybe the 10th one I've done. So I'm still figuring out, still figuring out what questions to ask, still figuring out how to flow things, still trying to figure out like, how do I make men uncomfortable, but not too uncomfortable where they shell up? You know, because as some of us know, when men get into a space with a bunch of men, they're not talking about trauma. <laughs> so, like, I don't know if anyone ever, like, uh, when you get a bunch of men into a room, they're not sitting around talking about trauma out of nowhere, you know? So it was like step, I had to like start figuring out ways to connect people to one another, how to get guys out of their comfort zone, how to question them, how to make them think deeper. And uh, the best thing that happened was I'm in my hometown and if you build it, they will come. So you men... You know, if you start, ever want to start your men's spaces and you don't know where to start, trust me, I had no idea where I was going to start. No clue. I just did it. And that's what our people did for thousands and thousands of years on both sides, both the African community, indigenous community. We were doers. We saw a problem within our community. We went and did something about it. We didn't sit around and point out the problem. Like a lot of our, our communities have a bad, bad problem with doing is we point out the problem, we point out the problem, but then we bond over the problem. It's like, okay, we know the problem, let's go, let's go do something about it. <laughs> so I'm in my hometown. The first day of my circle is a five day circle. The very first day I have four people. The next day I had nine, then I had 15. And what opened the floodgates for everybody, which was cool. The third day, like I said, I had 15. The next day um, it went up to 16. Okay, but because of what happened, this is what happened. There's a young man in my community, we were at culture camp and everyone was kind of shaming him because uh, he got drunk and you know he had a fallout with his girlfriend and uh, there was a DV charge. 
and everyone's pissed off at him. Everyone's mad at him, myself included. I'm disappointed in him, but I've known this guy since he was a young boy. And when I talk about him being a young boy, this is a young boy who uh, lost his dad when he was in first grade and whose dad was also abusive before that. This is a young boy whose mom went on basically a 12 year binge in a sense and was dealing with her trauma and wasn't raising her, her and uh, her two sons. So this young boy had to raise his little brother and he was dealing with so much things. And that's not an excuse. And that's what I always emphasize. It's never an excuse for behavior whatsoever but it's a sense of empathy and compassion and actually listening. Like I said, listening, that's what's given me the opportunity to really meet people where they're at is because I spent so much time just sitting down and listening. So this young man, again, we're at 15 on the third day. I see this boy that day and we're, I'm walking through the hallways because he's working at the culture camp. And I see him and I say, uh, come, come up to the circle tomorrow, bro. He goes, uh, he's like, no, man. No, you're, you're going to tell everyone not to be like me. You're going to tell everyone how bad I am. I'm not going to that. I was like, no, 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 no. It's all, no, no I'm not going to do that. You know, it's going to be a safe space. The next day he shows up. And it's because I created a safe, a safe space for him not to be shamed, not to be guilted, not to be told how terrible he is. And what happened was he came that turned into 16 on the fourth day. On our fifth day, we had 31 men that showed up. 31 men. And this is a town of 300 people. And again, this is a town, I had three or four guy of these men who barely come out of their houses, but because they heard that this was a space for openness and non-judgment, that's why they were compelled to come. And that's, I, that's what led me to being able to hold these spaces. I spent so much time listening, learning, creating empathy, and that's what it's gonna take in order for us to change our communities. We have to sit down, we have to listen to one another, we have to have good conversations. And that's why, again, that's why I encourage every single person that's, that's tuning in is, wherever you are out in your community, wherever you stand, like it's never a bad time to do as much as you can. It's never a bad time to go speak with children. It's never a bad time to go speak with your elders and learn your language. You know, to learn your songs, to learn your protocol, to learn your history. And if your elders don't know your history, then at the end of the day, and this is where I'm struggling with right now, is we lost all of our coming of age ceremony for men. We have a couple of small things that are still intact. And right now is what I'm doing is I'm doing my due, 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 due diligence and I'm going to our elders. I'm grabbing bits and pieces. I'm grabbing bits and pieces from my mother. My son, he's going to go through all the steps to becoming a man. I'm going to teach him how to fight with a paddle like our people traditionally did. I'm going to teach him how to hunt. He's already fished. I'm going to teach him all of these things. He could introduce himself in our language. He's seven. Okay. He knows the history. He talks about genocide. We talk about residential school. Again, he's seven. So at the end of the day, we have to start thinking of what can we do to build the future that I want to see. Because constantly we can have people sitting around. Oh, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. Just do something. So again, that's what I would encourage everybody to take from this is just become a doer. And that's what my journey is, is I was a village boy. And like I said, my passion of basketball brought me to my purpose and I'm still slowly refining my purpose. So again, it's not about having the answers. It's not about being a specialist or the guru of anything or being, you know, you just have to do it. And that's what I would leave you guys with is just getting out and doing it is the best thing you could possibly do. And if I could support anyone getting out there and doing it with my work, then I'm more than happy to do so because that's what it's all about is we have to give the cheat codes to the next generation because we don't want them to go through the things that we went through. We don't want them to have the very, very hard conversations that we're forced to have today. But what those conversations are going to do is it's going to give us opportunities to create better connections and create, create better communities down the road. So I leave you with that. You know, I appreciate it. I'm really, really thankful for this opportunity. And I hope, you know, I hope you took one or two things from it. And uh, I guess I'll open up for questions, EC. Yes, awesome. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, feel free to unmute or type in the chat. Um, you can you could either say them in the chat publicly, or if you don't want that, you could DM it to um, Lauren or Hajar, who are both on this and are monitoring um, monitoring the chat. Um, yeah, does anyone have any 
immediate questions. If so, I still I have some questions, but we have one from Jalen. Is it Jalen Henry? Yes, I have one actually. Um, so first of all, just thank you for coming in your time and uh, everything you said. And uh, so I guess my question is, you know, when you started going to these villages and kind of just, you know, assimilating or not assimilating, but absorbing the culture and, and getting into it, how did you, for one, you know, find the courage to kind of just, you know, walk in and, and uh, you know, kind of establish yourself in that way, but also, you know, how did you go through that? Like, did you have to, you know, stay with someone? Did you have to you know, go with the, uh, you know, the leaders of those tribes or, you know, how did that process go? Yeah, so I mean, when they, I would, I was asked to come do camps and everything like that. And like I said, they would ask me to come do one thing, but I would just literally say, like, hey, if you want to take me to this, if you want to take me to that, because at the end of the day, our communities were proud, proud people, you know, and when you, especially when you travel to smaller communities, they'll bring you in as long as your intentions are right. So I think that's the biggest part is I was always just super curious, you know, and it wasn't of me of like trying to exploit anything or, or coming in a, in a bad way. It was just, I was just super curious. So I think that's the biggest thing is I, I always ask questions, you know, no matter what, there's no such thing as a dumb question, you know, and you, I'm sure you've heard that before. There's no such thing as a dumb question. And even in these, in these communities or, or if you ever want to go immerse yourself somewhere, the biggest thing is, like I said, is intention. Because if you have the right intention when you go into a situation, people will take care of you. So I think that would be the biggest thing is this. I always just led with the right, with a good intention. All right. Um, the next question. Um, how do you facilitate conversation for men to talk about trauma? So I, it's kind of steps. Uh, it's 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 really interesting steps. So when I first started, everyone would come to me and say, "Hey, you need to tell guys how, how to treat women better." <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, I would try that, but I would try to express somebody." So a lot of you probably heard the term, "You can't love somebody else until you love yourself," right? It's true for men as well. So in order for men to be able to show up, we have to teach men how to love themselves and teach them how to bond amongst each other. So my foundation, my steps are. I talk about trauma, but actually, sorry, the first part is I make men feel heard, seen, and valued, right? Introduce yourself. What do you like to do? And guess what? Then what it does, it creates connection because if I have this big old circle, and this man says, I like to hunt, I like to fish. You're going to hear three or four guys pop up here and say, I do too. Oh, I like biking. Oh, this guy over here likes biking, right? Shared story. Shared. So now I have them heard, seen, and valued because after I they talk and tell me, I say, hey, thank you. I appreciate you for being here. Men aren't told that very often, okay? I appreciate your time. I appreciate you taking the time to be here tonight. Always emphasize, like, you want to make people feel good. So that's the first step is heard, seen, and valued. Here's your in the space. The next step is start talking about trauma. And again, it's being able to give men language behind what they're feeling or what they've experienced. Every man, okay, what did residential school do to our men? Every, you know, seven out of 10 boys who attended residential school were sexually abused. So then you start to hear that you hear these men and all these guys go, my uncle attended residential school, mine too. That makes sense. That's why he did this. or that's why he's like this. Okay. So then you start putting language behind these stories and behind these feelings. The next step is um, how do men bond? And these are the steps I'm going to go through in my circle tomorrow. And we're going to actually dive into it. The next step is what does healthy relationships amongst men look like? Because there's nothing more accountable, more powerful than a man holding a man accountable. Yeah. The next step is then we get to how do we become better allies to women? So that's the biggest thing is we can't throw a million things on people because just like all of us, we're all unlearning and learning. And that was my thing is like I was trying to tackle a million different things at once, but like, okay, I just need to hone in on one thing. And then once I could make, start to make baby steps with that, and then the next thing. So I think that's the biggest part of facilitating anything is meeting your meeting your circle where they're at and being able to make them all feel involved. And even if people don't like sharing, making sure they still have the option. So I think that would be my biggest approach to it is I, just, I make everyone feel like they belong in their in the space, regardless of uh, how they might feel about themselves. 
Um, another question. So how do you balance vulnerability in talks with personal wellness and self-care, as in so you don't relive your trauma in a detrimental way? You know, and I think that that, that was the biggest part for me was that I had to get to a point of, you know, because at, at the beginning, when I first started sharing my story, it was very, my story, it was very generalized. And then I started diving the trenches once I started diving the trenches up here. So I started to dive into how my father was or what I experienced. So I think honestly, it depends on your, on you learning your threshold and learning, making sure you don't re-trigger yourself over and over again. And I actually experienced that this summer. Um, I moved back home for a bit this summer to manage a couple of grants around addiction and suicide prevention. And it was the, the most triggersome month in a, ever, literally ever. And that's why I decided to go on this big 1500 mile bike ride I just finished up with. Uh, but I would say that that would be my take on it is like learning your threshold and not overextending yourself because there's times where I'll do a lot of trauma work and talking about these deep, deep, hard, difficult things. And then I'll go disappear for a week. And I won't talk to nobody. So I think that's it is knowing your threshold and not feeling bad when you have to tell people no, or you have to ex excuse yourself, or if you have to shut yourself off for a little bit. All right, so another question. Um, do you feel like you have to pick one piece of your identity depending on the space, or are you able to fully and authentically be yourself? That's a great question. I've been fortunate and that's, that's a hard part. That's the very, very hard part is that I have to, I, cause I always acknowledge that I have privilege. I have an immense amount of privilege because of what I've accomplished in basketball. Um, so that's, I think I've been fortunate cause I went to a very racist high school and I would see how native kids were treated, how they've had their head, heads down. So when I step into these spaces, like everyone knows my background in a sense, you know, because when they bring me into these spaces, they already know what I come with and they know who I am. So. I always emphasize my father was black, you know, his, his family came from was out there in Ohio for the last 200 years. And, you know, and, and I'm able to really understand like it's both sides and the people who, who, who meet me there or who are in these spaces, I just emphasize like I'm, I'm, I'm one of both, but early in my career, it was really, I had to get to a point of being very comfortable with um, identifying with the black side as well because I grew up in a, in a very indigenous community. And where I grew up, like, we're very, 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 very proud people. And even till I started playing AAU, I didn't get to tap into my blackness or that black side, um, which because I, you know, I started playing with um, all black teams pretty much. And I went to college and I was out here in Oklahoma and I started to hear about, you know, the, um, about Black Wall Street over here in Tulsa, and the, you know, the, the Tulsa bombing and so all that, those things that took place. So once I started to hear more of my black side, I got way more comfortable with really going into spaces like this is who I am on both sides. And, but it took, it took a long time to get there, you know, and now I, you know, I, I've gotten to the point of being confident in it. Um, awesome. Um, so, um, net a question from Amy Nichols. Um, I squeal. Um, good day. Um, <laughs> my name, given name is Amy, and I'm a member of the Samish Nation. Um, I'm really thankful for you, um, to be speaking with us. Um, and maybe we'll catch each other on the water um, canoeing sometime. But um, my question is about, um, my question is about gender roles because something that I've been struggling with as an indigenous person is this notion that our gender roles like in Western society are not the same as who we were as people before colonialism um, and I guess um, I, I kind of want to oh did she what happened <laughs> oh she's... Um, I have really quality audio um, but basically like how do you handle this notion that indigenous like our cultures gender roles were different and like to make that work mm -hmm. so um <clears throat> within
Thank you. Right. Uh, no, so I think it's, it's, uh, it is an interesting conversation because I remember my mom um, getting really, really upset with me when we would use homophobic slurs, rightfully so when I was a kid. And I remember she smacked me upside my head one time and told me not to use the word, but she always, she really emphasized, she's like, there were no shaming, there were no, uh, we, we, we had open space for everybody to be exactly who they were. So we had men's and women's houses, but when it came to our hunting, when it came to our fighting, like some of our most badass warriors were women, you know, like my mom, my mom's a 5'10 powerhouse. And to this day, to this day, and I've been all over Indian country to this day, there's no one who could out sing my mom. And, and it's not me, but she, my mom hunted, my mom fished. My, I grew up around a lot of very, very powerful aunties. So I just kind of lead when I talk with men and they're talking about, oh, this, this, and this, my, hey, I know a lot of women who could out paddle you, who could out hunt you on any given day, you know, who could out clean, you know, who could out dress a, a, a deer way quicker than you, you know? So I think it's getting kind of like, I know it's a hard, hard conversation, especially as a woman, you know, but um, I think that's been my approach to it was this acknowledging and having backing on like, okay, like there were no gender roles before first contact, our men and women fought side by side, you know? So I think that'd be the biggest thing is being able to go back and, and to kind of express that, you know, th these are the things that we did have intact before first contact. And um, again, I guess being able to, to, look into other nearby tribes where the case may be but everyone's different so uh, i think it's just kind of yeah educating more and more people on how things once were and there were no specific roles all right um the next question um why do you feel as though it's not your place to speak up about missing and murdered indigenous women and women's rights, especially when conversations about masculinity, misogyny, and the patriarchy have everything to do with the gendered violence against black and native women, especially trans women. When invisibility is at the root of their oppression, they need visibility. So why aren't you using your platform to amplify these voices? You know, and that's a, that's a thing is that, you know, I, I always have when it comes to sharing, when it comes, I'm talking about when it comes to me creating my own space to have that conversation or me opening my space to have a conversation because I'm always going to feel, because for example, I got asked to come speak at an event and it was about murder and missing indigenous women. And I showed up and I gave presence, um, but I didn't speak. I asked them to have somebody who has maybe a survivor or somebody who has more um, knowledge in that space. So it's, I wouldn't say I don't feel like it's my place. I would say I don't feel like it's my space to take up um, unless I'm called on. And I, and, 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 and that's in person or the case may be, but if you look at my platform, if you look at my social medias, I will always post statistics on the violence our women have endured. Um, I'm constantly backing our, our women and whatnot. So um, I, yeah, I wouldn't say it was, I, not my place maybe i had misworded that but not my place but more so not my space to take up all right um being respectful of everyone's time we're at uh 6 59 p.m eastern standard um so thank you so much for coming to the first event in the indigenous holistic health series um the series continues tomorrow with damon and his men's circle at 6 p.m eastern standard time uh the final two events in the series will be uh chelsea, chelsea lugar and Fosh collins from well for culture the seven circles of wellness presentation on november 5th at 6 p.m and a workshop on november 12th at the same time thank you again damon for sharing with us and y'all have a wonderful night Thank you.